Hi, and you're now with the Forerunner Chronicles, and right now we have an awesome interview. With me right now, I have Karen Hughes, and in my estimation, she should be the most sought-after interview in all of major media at this time, because the information she has to share is extremely explosive, but there's a reason behind um, why she is not being sought after the way that I deem that she should be. And I'm sure that she's going to get into that at least briefly in this interview. But at this time, I just want to thank you for doing this interview with us right now, Ms. Hughes. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very glad to be here with you today. And just to give you a brief overview of who we're speaking to here, this is the individual that used to be the senior counselor at the World Bank, 20-odd years in, at the World Bank, but I'm not going to say any more. I want her to tell you all about her background. Go ahead, Ms. Hughes. Well, um, I'm called the World Bank whistleblower, but there's actually a whole team of us. One of us is from Scotland. That's Elaine Colville. Mm -hmm. And the two of us teamed up and got statements up in um, the website of the UK Parliament. The last statement that we got up was in July. And there, um, Elaine answered uh, the question, whether the UK Parliament was protecting the public in the UK and was um, answering complaints of its people by saying absolutely not. She had spent about three or four years complaining to uh, the ombudsman, the prime minister. She just exposed the whole government in the United Kingdom. Wow. Now, I had met with the UK Serious Fraud Office in 2010, and after that, the Serious Fraud Office called up the Securities and Exchange Commission which stonewalled. So I told the UK Parliament that the Serious Fraud Office had not followed up properly. And then I answered another question that the UK Parliament asked. They wanted to know whether they should privatize things. And I said no, because there was a terrible cover-up of fraud and corruption in the very center of the financial system, and that this was going to land the whole world in a ditch, in a currency war, if the UK Parliament didn't do something about it. I said, I told the UK Parliament about this twice already, and they are just simply sitting on their hands. So no, the UK Parliament does not uh, have a good complaint process because we are running out of time. Wow. And so that's, you know, that's part of the way the World Bank whistleblowers work. Um, the World Bank is uh, one of uh, the group called the Bretton Woods Institutions. There's the International Monetary Fund right across the street from the World Bank. They, these two organizations were created in 1944 uh, by 44 countries. Right now, they're um, 188 countries. Right. And when this corruption hit, and by the way, um, I did just what a lawyer is supposed to do inside one of these organizations. The World Bank issues bonds on the capital markets, $180 billion worth of bonds. So all of the governments of the world are responsible for cleaning up the corruption. Now, if I can just stop you for one minute, that's, that's the whole reason why you're not with the World Bank anymore, because you were doing your job as a lawyer, and you were talking, speaking out about the corruption that you saw taking place within that institution. Can you talk a little bit about your um, run-ins with the individuals over there as you were trying to do your job? Yes, um, I certainly can. And let me tell you that um, there are people who have been helping all along. And the number of people that have been helping has grown by leaps and bounds because one of the things that the World Bank is, is it's a knowledge bank. Mm -hmm. And there was um, a very accurate modeling tool that was actually developed in the Department of Defense. And uh, Yasser Kugler is a political scientist who came to the World Bank. And I, you know, I was very curious about what he was, he had to, um, to show to the rest of the world. Right. And right. so I took him with me to Ghana, and then I asked him if he would give me a freebie and model rule of law. Mm -hmm. And that was in 2004, and this model is very, very accurate. It's got a track record um, that if there ever, there's ever um, a dispute between the intelligence analysts and the, the model, the model wins hands down every time. Mm -hmm. So I modeled rule of law, and it was just inside the World Bank. But guess what? The World Bank is kind of like um, a microcosm. It's a reflection of the whole world politics inside one organization. It's like a co-op, but the countries don't just have one country, one vote. The votes are weighted. 
the United States is the most powerful country. It has a 16% vote. And then the other countries have smaller shares. But so when I was modeling rule of law at the World Bank, I was actually also modeling rule of law inside the whole world. I hadn't understood that. I thought the corruption that I was reporting was just a problem internal to the organization. I thought it could be solved. But then when uh, the U.S. Congress asked the World Bank to, um, to solve the problem and then they fired me, I realized that there was a bigger problem behind that corruption inside the World Bank. And I'll, you know, I'll cut right to the end of where the problem is okay. uh, because it's been kind of like going up in an elevator. You think you've uh, solved the problem and then it turns out there's corruption behind that corruption. Behind and, the veil, per se. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like peeling an onion to get to the inside to mm -hmm. see where, the, where all this corruption is coming from. And where did you so, find the paper trail led to? Well, it's also the money trail. You know how they say follow the money? The money trail, that's right. Yes. So um, there's uh, the best university in Europe is called the Federal Institute of Technology. That's in, it's Zurich, in Zurich, Switzerland. Switzerland. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. And there are three mathematicians who took accurate data on who owns the world's companies. There's 43,000 of the um, transnational corporations who have shares traded on the capital markets. Right. And they, they found out that there was a secret super entity, mostly bankers. So you've got Goldman Sachs, you've got Citibank, you've got Bank of America, you've got, uh, you know, Deutsche Bank. But it turns out that these banks are actually all one bank. Wow. Yeah. And they're the group that owns the U.S. Federal Reserve System. And they also have seized control of 60% of the annual earnings on the capital markets and 40% of the value of these companies. But they didn't do it by investing a lot of money. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's a lot of money, but they have 10 times more the power that you would actually expect them to have. And they did this very cleverly by having the same directors go from one mm -hmm. of these companies to another to another. And to answer your first question, they also control all of the media. They control the television programs, they control the press, they control the movies. And so um, you're being brainwashed every single day of your life. And when you're trying to find explanations for what's going on, the first thing you need to do is to disregard what's ever on the news or written on the headlines, because that's just to trick you and to keep you ignorant. I can give you another analogy. And it's a very good analogy. Think of The Wizard of Oz. Mm. It was written by, um, I forget his first name, Baum. Right. He, he was writing something to educate people about what they needed to do for their money system. And so the yellow brick road... The economy. That's, that's gold. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And the Wizard of Oz? The Wizard of Oz is those groups I was telling you about that control the capital markets. Mm -hmm. They are present... You know the screen that the Wizard of Oz had? Right. That's what, the, that's what your media is telling you. And the dog that pulls, Toto, that pulls the curtain aside, that's me and the rest of the World Bank whistleblowers. And the world is now looking to see what the Wizard of Oz has in store for them. So let me ask you a question, because recently it just came out into the news that several billionaires in the United States of America, like John Paulson, Warren Buffett, Soros, they're beginning to take all their money out of U.S. stocks. I think um, Buffett just just got rid of about 19 million shares of Johnson & Johnson, and then you have Soros that's gotten rid of almost all of his bank stocks, including in J.P. Morgan, Chase, Citigroup, and Goldman Sachs, which you just made mention of a minute ago. Is there something that they, don't, that they know that we should know? Yes and no. They are, they've got a playbook, and they think that they're going to make the markets crash, they think that the U.S. dollar is going to um, become worthless. They've got a whole um, scenario worked out. Is that the but direction this, that this super entity is trying to move our economy in right now? Are they trying to crash the U.S. dollar? Yes, but I can tell you that their playbook isn't, they're, they're not calling the shots. Mm -hmm. We have, and I'll tell you how I know this because I was telling you about this very accurate model right. that, 
that this political scientist, Yasek Kugler, who chaired the uh, political science department at Claremont. Anyway, um, this, this model predicted that if we could get a country to uh, expose this corruption, just one, we would then have rule of law. And that country was the United Kingdom, but it's not just the United Kingdom. For example, I was um, a witness at the uh, European Parliament in 2011. I have been contacting the uh, Congress on this corruption for many, many years. Uh, before I was fired in 2007, Senator Luger wrote three letters to the World Bank saying, don't fire this lady. He was very disappointed when I was fired because he knew very well when I went, first, I, before I went to the Congress, I stayed inside the World Bank, which is what a lawyer is supposed to do. I went up the corporate ladder. I went to the audit committee, which is when the Dutch government wrote a letter to the World Bank saying that they wanted the audit committee to look into the problem. Now, the um, French government, uh, Pierre Duquesne, was then chairing the audit committee. And what uh, Mr. Duquesne did was instead of investigating the problem in the audit committee, he asked for there to be a study of something called the Institutional Integrity Department. That was um, the World Bank Anti-Corruption Department. Right. And so Paul Volcker came in, and what he did was um, he did a bogus study. You know, he did a study that's really more of a cover-up than a study. But in the meantime, all of the people that were working for the Institutional Integrity Department were trying to tell him what was really going on, and they were getting fired and intimidated. So there's a newspaper um, article. I don't know if you know Common Dreams, but right. Common Dreams um, has talked about what the people inside the Institutional Integrity Department were trying to tell Paul Volcker. Mm -hmm. And uh, those people ultimately ended up getting compensated. But in the meantime, the Volcker panel study, which said that there was no corruption inside the World Bank, the U.S. kept pretending like everybody believed it. But what was actually going on was um, at that point, uh, there was a president of the World Bank, Paul Wolfowitz. And Paul Wolfowitz, um, when he came in and became president, he gave a huge pay raise to his girlfriend, Shaha Riza. Um, and the board didn't like that. So they were firing Paul Wolfowitz, except that, uh, do you remember what happened to Elliot Spitzer, the former governor of New York, who went to the uh, New York madam and then he had to step down? Right. Well, some of the executive directors, there's 25 of them, um, they represent the countries of the world. The, f the biggest eight economies each get their own executive director. So that's Germany, France, the United Kingdom, um, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Japan. I'm missing one. But anyway, um, then the rest of the countries share executive directors. And these executive directors were being blackmailed because some of them had gone to the New York madam. Some of them had spent money in their bank accounts that made them vulnerable. Wow. And I found out about this because um, in addition to having studied law at Yale Law School, I studied economics at the University of Amsterdam and I speak Dutch. And I happened to be in Holland when the representative of the Dutch government, Herman Weifels, uh, mentioned that the board was being blackmailed. And then the next day, his predecessor, who was um, named Ad Melkert, and Ad, at that point, um, had left the World Bank Board and was working at the United Nations Development Program. Anyway, um, Ad went on a television show in Holland, and they asked him, they said, Ad, were you being blackmailed too? And he said, well, I'm a boring guy. He said, but I knew other people on the board, and they certainly were very upset at this. So this and is... so I came home, and I went to, um, first I went back to the Senate, and uh, Senator Luger's staff said that I should go to the Treasury Department. So I went to Kenneth Peel. I also wrote the dean of the Yale Law School. I said, have you lost your mind? You cannot be blackmailing other countries' diplomats like this, wow. especially when this is not even a security interest, that uh, Paul Wolfowitz should be free to give a, a pay raise to his girlfriend. How is, this, how is this something in the national interest that you should be blackmailing other countries' ambassadors. I said, this is going to come home to roost. And I had um, spoken with Chuck Hagel, who was then the senator of uh, Nebraska, and I was telling him how this model was warning us that we were going to lose our, our leadership. We were going to lose something called the Gentleman's Agreement, which was an agreement that the president of the World Bank would always be appointed by the United States. Just anybody we wanted, we right. said it, we'd get it. And the same thing for Europe. 
they would get the managing director of the IMF, International Monetary Fund. Now, these two organizations, they look like they're separate, but they're really, um, for all practical purposes, they're just two sides of the same coin. Uh, they have the same um, board of governors. That's the ministers of finance or the ministers of development from all of the 188 countries. Those people come together twice a year. And then you've got the board that's resident. And I, I said it's very clear that the way the um, rules work inside the World Bank and because of this analysis that I had on rule of law, I said we're going to lose our leadership position. And I was so certain that that warning was going to be enough. But because of what I was telling you about the um, super entity, the cabal, right. that's, uh, that's actually hijacked the World Bank. But guess what? It hijacked the United States government. Hmm. It hijacked a lot of other countries' governments. But and that's what's actually happened. Multi-level corruption that you were looking at. So while you were in the World Bank and you're seeing this multi-level corruption going on, did anybody offer you a hand in the Ponzi scheme? Well, it's only relatively recently that people have started offering me anything. And I, you know, every time that happens, um, it's not that I'm uncorruptible. It's that I have a big mouth. And so they'll offer me something that, you know, sort of looks attractive. But before I know it, I'm telling somebody else about the fact that I've been offered this incredible bribe. And so it just doesn't work. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> and uh, and you have to also recognize what happened to the presidents that didn't want this Federal Reserve system mm -hmm. to go forward. Let me explain how it works. OK, if you have the Treasury Department that's issuing the currency then you don't have to pay interest on it. But if you have the Treasury Department issue a promissory note to the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve then issues the currency, then this note that, that the Treasury Department issued, there's interest on it. And that's how the debt every year gets bigger and bigger because we're going to be spending more money than we're taking in. And let me tell you how the tax payments work. Okay. This, I couldn't believe in the beginning, but it's absolutely true. Um, you know, when you fill out your taxes and you send a check one place and you send the tax form another place, the check that you send goes directly to the Federal Reserve and they take that check and they send it to the United Kingdom and the UK keeps, not the government, the UK banksters keep 40% and then they send 60% on to the Jesuits in the Vatican. That's what's happening to our tax dollars. Wow. Now, how are we how are we financing our government? We're selling drugs. We're selling the drugs that we grow in Afghanistan. We never had any poppies there until the war in Afghanistan. You think with all the satellites flying over they couldn't see where the poppy fields are? No, that's how we earn our our money. Wow. How, how does that grab you? Is that a good arrangement? Wow. No, it's not a good arrangement. So you are you basically saying that the money that's being fed into the IRS ends up at the Vatican? 60% of it, except for the 40% cut that goes to the United Kingdom. And now, let me tell you how that happened. <laughs> that happened because in 1200, the King of England borrowed a lot of money from the Vatican because of wars and signed a treaty that he would agree to keep repaying the money to the Vatican. And, of course, he never caught up. So he was in trouble. And then, do you remember when our Capitol building was burned down in 1812 by the right, UK? Right. Yeah. Okay. We have been having to pay war reparations to the United Kingdom all these years, and nobody has bothered to tell the people about it. And Lincoln, when he was financing the Civil War, issued greenbacks directly without involving right. the bankers. Mm -hmm. That's why he was rubbed out. And JFK, he had an, a memo that he was going to sign where he was going to just erase this this um, compounding of interest on the U.S. debt. He was going to have our currency issued directly by the Treasury Department. He was assassinated 11 days after he signed that memo. So these banksters are bound and determined to keep us, you know, what can I say, imprisoned in debt, except that it's not working because what we've done is we've alerted all the countries of the world. I have written to the ambassadors of all these countries many, many times. I've written to, um, in Washington and in New York, I wrote them a letter um, a couple of months ago 
where I was telling them about the fact that their ambassadors were all being blackmailed when they tried to fire um, Paul Wolfowitz. So the whole world is laughing at the fact that the American public is totally in the dark and duped by their media that refused to tell them what's really happening. Now, I, I, I certainly want you to elaborate a little bit more on a specific point that you just made. And, and I took you back to it a second ago. And that's the fact that our tax dollars, you're saying 60% of our tax dollars get cut to the Vatican and the Jesuits. And I think for a lot of people out there, that's a pretty astounding um, you know, revelation because you, know, you think of the Jesuits, we have uh, Pope Francis now, whom our president praises, and he's the very first Jesuit pope. And some people, when they think of the Jesuits, they think of an order of meek and humble men and all of these things. Why would the Vatican and the Jesuits be, you know, caught up in such a stink like this? You know, what do you, what in your perception, and what is their worldview? Are they a bunch of megalomaniacs? Um, are they just trying to uh, amass a stupendous amount of wealth? What, what do you perceive in this whole situation for the Jesuits in the Vatican? I, I'm so sorry to have to tell you. First of all, let me, let me start out by saying that this has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. This has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the people of faith that are not aware of this. That's right. And um, I have to tell you that there are, unfortunately, people who will mock the faith and they will put on the priest's garb just so that they can hide their crimes. Mm -hmm. These are criminals. These are not Catholics. Wow. And unfortunately, there are many of them at the very top. It's rot at the top. Wow. And that's the way it is. And it's been documented. And I, you know, I've been working with people who have documented this. It's been going on for a very, very long time. You can read what our founding fathers had to say about the Jesuits. After Lincoln was assassinated, the Jesuits were not allowed um, certain things, certain privileges in the United States. Right. And that ban on the Jesuits was lifted by Ronald Reagan, unfortunately. That's very interesting that you said that because... You know, I do have some knowledge of this. I just wanted to hear what you wanted to, had to say on the issue. But all throughout the 1600s, the Jesuits were actually put out of all of the nations in Europe because the monarchs there realized that they were the ones responsible for fomenting these revolutions within their countries. And Ronald Reagan, interestingly, was the first one to um, appoint an ambassador to the Vatican for the United States of America. And we know that Pope John Paul II and Reagan worked very closely together for the bringing down of the USSR. And so, very interesting. Anyway, um, please proceed. Well, um, I think, let me, let me switch to um, where, where we're working together, what we have achieved. Right. And people are going to be surprised. But first, actually, let me tell you a little bit about um, what goes on with the birth certificates of your children. If you look at them, their names are all in capital letters. This is because when a baby is born and gets a social security number, what the uh, bankers are doing is they're estimating the amount of taxes that that child is going to generate through their lifetime as a taxpayer. Hmm. And they issue a bond on the capital markets in the name of that baby. And then, um, this, this sounds improbable, but Again, I'm telling you, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. That's right. So when you're married and you go before a justice of the peace, your marriage license is also in all caps. It's as if two ships had met in the night. Maritime law. You're not law. really married. Maritime law. That's right. Mm -hmm. And it, this huge um, scheme has been um, bilking the American citizens out of their their wealth, mm -hmm. but also out of their status as citizens with a constitution. I just have to say this once again for everybody that's watching. This is Karen Hughes, the former senior counselor for the World Bank, 20 years in the World Bank. She's not some raving lunatic. This is a well-educated individual at the Ivy League school, Yale. I think we need to listen. Go ahead, my sister. <laughs> well... It, we're, we're, the United States is not the only country that has been, um, what can I say, 
um, put in this terrible situation. It's called state capture. Yes. But it's not hopeless. As a matter of fact, we're winning. We're taking our republic back. And the way that we are doing this is uh, it's just beautiful. It's more beautiful than you can ever imagine. Uh, there are people who have devoted their entire lives to going around from state to state and alerting people to this problem. And we have in um, our constitution, Article 5, which says that when state legislatures ask for a constitutional convention, the Congress is required to call a constitutional convention. So by 1929, Wisconsin was the 35th state to request a constitutional convention and wrote a scathing letter when the constitutional convention was not called. By now, we now have 49 of 50 state legislatures that have called for a constitutional convention. This convention should happen yesterday and we can take back our republic. Wow. It's, it's all there for us. We don't have to do anything other than demand our rights. Now, what about this mega conglomerate? Are they going to just allow this to happen? Do they have their cards on the table to try to uh, make sure that they continue to operate business as usual? Well, remember when I was talking about um, Toto pulling the curtain back? Right. People are now looking at them and seeing what they're doing. So I'll, give, I'll tell you what happened last week. Um, two things. One is that all of the um, Congress was told to get on four airplanes, military aircraft, and fly to Florida for the funeral of one of one of the members of Congress. And I've been working together with a group of people. Um, they call themselves Able Danger. That's named after an agent that was um, working to try to prevent uh, false flags. And uh, anyway, so we warned we warned Congress that if they got on those aircraft, one of two things could happen. It could be diverted to um, a prison. It could be diverted to Guantanamo Bay. Or it could crash that, those military aircraft. Hmm. Um, and we advised them not to go. And as a result, only 30 Congress people did go. Hmm. So, you know, we're working the problem. And um, Karen, why another. doesn't any intelligence agency get neck deep into this thing like the CIA? They are part of the problem. Now, when you say they're part of the problem, expound on that a little bit. When the CIA was set up, it was set up with a, a special job to guard the world's gold. There's a lot more gold than people know about, about three or four times what people are officially told. Right. And a lot of this gold is on deposit all over the world. There's 170,000 tons in the Bank of Hawaii. That's more than people say is in existence on Earth already. Yeah? Right. And the CIA was set up to guard that gold. Wow. It wasn't even supposed to be for the United States alone. It was supposed to be for that special purpose. But they lost their way, wow. the CIA. Well, 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 at least, why, don't, why doesn't the CIA at least uh, spank the Jesuits on their hands? What's the situation with that? Because the Jesuits are in charge of the CIA. Wow. That's a, that's a big revelation there. Um, wow, you've said so much. I'm going to continue on this, this line um, because you made mention of Lincoln and uh, him actually moving in the right direction for our country, issuing greenbacks, and because of that, he ended up in a casket. Then you have JFK. And uh, he was trying to move our nation back in the right direction as well. Interesting enough, first Catholic president, and he ended up body bagged. So, <laughs> why? What about all of their successors, if I can say it that way? Um, is it that the presidents thereafter fell in line? Is Obama falling in line? Let's just get right to the, you know, right to the punch. Is Obama falling in line with the whole agenda? Or is he pushing at it anyway? What's your take on that? Unfortunately, um, he's not in a position. Um, he's his wife is being blackmailed. How so? But um, because she has fallen for some uh, what they call honey traps. Wow! In a in a hotel with two way mirrors, she has been compromised. I know what a honey trap is. 
Wow. Wow, that's... And there are other things involving him. You know, his, his mother was a CIA agent, and he was raised... Um, he was raised in a way that, um, that made him a person who would trap people with honey traps. That was his mother's job in the CIA, to entrap people in hotels. Wow. That, that was a huge bomb. I have one that's even worse. I'm listening. Okay. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I believe it was the 8th of October, there was supposed to be a nuclear bomb detonated on South Carolina. And two army generals made sure that that bomb went off, off the coast, 600 miles off the coast and detonated under sea. And those military officers were fired. And now at this point, there are about 180 um, generals and brass that are being fired in, and these are the people that are protecting the uh, citizens of the United States. And a good evening to you on this Friday night, and we start with a developing story, a shakeup at the highest levels of the U.S. military. A top general in charge of nuclear weapons fired, and this comes 48 hours after another top military commander was dismissed. ABC's chief global affairs correspondent Martha Raddatz has been talking to her sources all day, has the very latest on what's happening right now. Martha. Diane, these officers have some of the highest security clearances you can get and have been in charge of the nation's most sensitive nuclear arsenals. A stunning chain of events. Today, Michael Carey, the two-star general responsible for the nation's three intercontinental ballistic missile wings, fired from his command. The reason? personal misbehavior on a military business trip. This comes just 48 hours after President Obama himself relieved the number two in command over the nation's nuclear arsenal over his suspected use of counterfeit poker chips. These follow an alarming string of general officers losing their jobs this year for inappropriate behavior, misconduct, or lack of leadership. Two Marine Corps generals fired less than two weeks ago for not providing proper force protection in Afghanistan, an Army Brigadier General relieved of duty for adultery, an Army two-star general fired for groping a civilian, and in March, a Navy one-star removed for racially insensitive comments and abusive leadership. Last spring, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was so concerned about all the high-profile cases, he sent a letter to Pentagon brass urging a recommitment to ethical leadership. This is and that's that's why they're being um, removed. <laughs>